Yeah, we're not doctors or giving any medical advice. This show is intended for educational purposes only, and you should talk to your doctor about any medical issues. Now let's get at it. Welcome to Chat the Fat, where nutrition authors Nissa Gron and T.C. Hale are going to break down common low-carb mistakes. Let's chat all things low-carb, keto, digestion, and more so you can maximize your results. Hello, and welcome back to Chat the Fat. This is episode two. I'm here with Nissa Gron. Nissa Gron, are you ready for episode two? I'm ready. I'm here, ready to chat the fat about fat. Well, it's a, we're doing lots of fats today. We're, we're fatting it about the fat and the chat and the fat. <laughs> um, and just so everybody knows, like I'm, I'm in my studio. A lot of times we make our bone broth in my studio so that when people yeah. don't come by the house, they're like, why does your house smell like Thanksgiving dinner all the time? <laughs> um, so we, we cook it out here. So I'm literally recording this like seven inches from a huge pot of bone broth. So if this episode is a little more delicious than others have been, you know why. And nutritious. And nutritious. Um, and I'm drinking bone broth too. I'm not just dipping the cup in there though. You've got to kind of <laughs> sift all the junks out or I'll have celery in my teeth while I'm talking. So awesome. this is episode two. So if we have or the one about us and then we had a one and now this is two, I... I guess we're really doing this show. Yep, we're here. Okay, let's do the show then. So let's roll on with episode Mm -hmm. two. Is anything exciting going on over there that I need to know about before we get in here? No, the sun's out today, which is typical in Arizona, but it hasn't been this winter, so that's pretty exciting. Right, we're pretty professional with rain this season too, which is pretty exciting because we usually have none and everything dries up and dies. So... What are we talking about today? Um, Today we are talking about fat on a keto diet, but more importantly, not digesting fat well on a keto diet. Yeah, which can really be a big deal. And we've talked about like troubles you can run into and uh, we're going to get deeper into a lot more of those in other episodes, but this is probably the biggest one, which is probably why we wanted to tackle this early on. Yeah, I think a lot of people out there just tell you to eat all the fat and then you'll be good. You'll lose weight as long as you eat fat. And I learned from my own situation that it's not true. Yeah, it just doesn't work out. And I I talk a lot in my books and in other shows about how, uh, you know, people will change a diet and they'll, and everybody says this type of food is healthier. This type of macronutrient is better for you. But when you're eating anything that your body can't process instead of just nourishing your body, you're giving your body a problem that it now has to deal with. So uh, most problems that the body deals with take nutrients and resources for the body to use to deal with those problems. So now you're not only not giving your body nutrients, but your body has to use other nutrients to deal with the problem that you just gave. Exactly. So what do we want to get into first? Um, So speaking of that and what other professionals might not tell you, what are some ways that you can tell that you might not be digesting fat very well? So let's say that you go day one on a keto diet and you throw up all over the sofa. (laughs) That's not good. That could be a sign. That could be a problem. So, you know, we look at things like, you know, nausea is a big one that is very typical when when bile is not flowing correctly. And when we talk about bile not flowing correctly, uh, bile is made by the liver and then it's stored in the gallbladder. And then uh, when the acid from the acid food from the stomach leaves the stomach, then the body squirts this bile down on there to kind of neutralize it so it doesn't burn your intestinal tract while it's moving through there. But this bile is also used to help us digest fats. It kind of emulsifies or or breaks down these fats into uh, fats that our body can use. So food sources of fats, uh, our body can't really use that. They have to be broken down into fats that our body can use. So uh, bile is how we do that, but a lot of people don't have their bile moving correctly. And when that's the case, they don't digest those fats and then the fats become a problem. So some signs of that is nausea. And nausea is a really big one, not only because the uh, fats that don't get digested kind of can turn toxic and ferment and rot. Um, And then that can create toxins that make us feel nauseous. But when 
bile isn't moving, the bile is kind of where the liver puts all the garbage in the body and says, hey, send this out the back door while you're, while you're on your way out there. And if the bile isn't moving, the garbage doesn't get taken out and then the system starts to become more and more toxic and it builds up and we can become nauseous just without eating anything, just because there's so many toxins in the system. So nausea is a super big one. Um, and if, especially if you get more nauseous when you eat fats or when yeah. you start increasing your fats when you go I remember keto. being nauseous a lot of my early days of keto and every time I tried low carb, the, nauseous, the nausea was always there. Right. And so it, it's really a big one and it's very common. Um, another one is a lot of gas. Um, and people will have diarrhea or, or loose stool issues, or if they look at their stool in the toilet, which you should, all the cool kids are, are stool, they're all stool gazing. That's what the cool kids do. But if you look at it and it's lighter than the color of like cardboard, then that's a sign that bile is not flowing, flowing well. Um, acne is a really big one or like itchy skin can, can be, uh, contributed by, uh, bile not flowing well. Um, so that's another popular, like that's popular with the keto kids is to have like a keto rash. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to go back and note that yesterday we were giving my kids a bath and my son who are potty training actually pooped in the bath and nice. the five-year-old couldn't get enough of looking at it. So he's definitely on the right path. He's on the right to stool, stool gazing. And yeah. the other one is on the right path to potty training. Look, mom, I did it. I <laughs> pooped in this really big potty. <laughs> That was fun. <laughs> That's excellent. Excellent job. So anyways, those are some signs that you can look out for um, to kind of get a clue on whether your bile is flowing right. So you know if you're going to digest fats well, maybe before you even start. There's an advanced one too. Uh, we talk about these like 11 uh, parameter test strips that you can get on Amazon. They're kind of like urine test strips. Yeah, can, I've done uh, those before. Yeah. You can kind of pee in a cup and then you dip the stick in there. And um, if it shows either bilirubin or urobilinogen on the dipstick as coming up as positive for the test, then those are really strong signs that your bile is not flowing correctly. We'll put the link to those test strips in the show notes too, if you guys want to check out what we're talking about. And the show notes will be at uh, chatthefat.com episode two. And with those strips, how often should you really use them to see if they're moving, the results are moving? You know, uh, with that, not everybody needs to do this, but if you feel like you're having some of these issues that we're talking about, it can be a good idea to kind of at least check it out. Uh, and with those strips, maybe you're only checking once every couple of weeks or so if you're taking steps to improve bioflow. Like if you tested and saw that there was trouble on there, then you'd want to to check that out every week or two to see if you're making progress in the right direction by taking some of the steps to to improve bioflow. All right. And they also show ketones on there, which isn't really the way we recommend you test for ketones. But if you're using urine strips, you might as well just get those. <laughs> right. Um, and it's not a whole lot more expensive. And they, they have like all these other parameters on there that can be really helpful for some people in specific situations. We kind of teach a little more about those in our uh, almost free digestion course at, at kickitnaturally.com, but um, they can help you look at some other things. And you, most people using these would be just starting out with uh, a ketogenic diet. So when that's the case, you can kind of look at the urine test strips to see if, hey, maybe I'm peeing out some, some ketones now. And, and that can be helpful in that first week or two. Just make sure that you understand that that kind of stops. Yes. Do you, want, do you want to explain why that stops? Um, so when you're on a keto diet and you first start, you have a lot of ketones spilling out through your urine. But once your body gets better at utilizing those ketones, then um, next it'll go come out through your breath. And that's why you get the stinky keto breath a lot of times. And then next, um, your body uses them more effectively. And then you should start showing blood ketones on a ketone monitor. Right. So we really like to, when we're looking for ketones, we really like to go with the blood ketone monitor that's the most effective way and now it's you know it's not super expensive like it was years ago and the meters are, are cheap so um that, that seems to be a, a better way to look at that yeah and we also have a link to the um, ketone meter we could put into the show notes as well okay. yeah if anybody's wanting to to check that out too we really like to do a lot of 
self, not diagnosis, but self testing <laughs> kind of things, you know, because when you can get some clues as to what's going on with your actual physiology, now you can adjust your keto diet to you and your unique body chemistry. You're not just doing what everybody says, keto this and keto <laughs> that, you know, you don't, you're not, you're not following the mainstream. You're doing what's right for you and, and your body. Exactly. Um, speaking about what everyone says about keto. So a lot of people come into a keto diet, um, sometimes from the standard American diet, sometimes from other diets like paleo or, you know, whatever else is out there. And a lot of people complain about bloating issues. Is bloating ever an issue of not digesting fat well? Um, it, it, it could be in like a roundabout way, but usually bloating is going to come from uh, either a lack of stomach acid, which is very common, and we'll come back to that in just a second, um, or some type of bacterial or fungal overgrowth in the stomach. And then the waste from that bacteria is very alkaline, uh, which can kind of neutralize any stomach acid that you have. And, and that way, uh, the food in our stomach doesn't break down correctly. So it breaks down by rotting and fermenting. And um, not only do the do, uh, our gas is created from the bacteria in your stomach, but then when this food is rotting, that's creating more gases too. And these gases literally expand and make your stomach expand or your intestinal tract expand and uh, you start to bloat. And a lot of people, when they go from the standard American diet, uh, even though keto is not a high protein diet, they may have not been eating any real food forms of protein or, or very s small amounts. So you know, the we, little little pieces of meats on like lean cuisines doesn't count? Right. Yeah, those three okay. little wedges of <laughs> what they say is chicken in, in the yeah. lean cuisine. Yeah, that probably is not when they start to like, oh, I'm going to have a steak now. And when they eat that steak, it just sits in their stomach for hours and it just rots and it ferments and they bloat and all that kind of trouble. But there is one other thing. Uh, if you're not processing fats well and um, the, uh, the bile is not flowing well, you can't really break the food apart correctly. You can't pull all the nutrients out of the food. You can't pull minerals um, out of the food like you're supposed to. And the body needs minerals to make hydrochloric acid, which is HCL, which is what helps us break down the food in the stomach. So if the body's not getting the nutrients it needs to create that HCL, then the stomach can become more alkaline. And then basically that acid is there to, as a barrier. It's supposed to kill all the bad guys that come in, but when it's not there, now the bacteria come in and they set up a party and, and that's when they really thrive and that's when we really start to bloat a lot. Yeah, definitely sounds like a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so earlier you had mentioned the dreaded keto rash and also itchy skin is a way of knowing that you're not breaking down fat well. How does um, the keto rash play into that itchy skin problem? Um, and itchy skin can happen for other reasons too. It's not just uh, keto or it's not, even, it's not even just fats. But <clears throat> when fats aren't broken down, remember that they, come, they become a problem. It's an issue that the body has to deal with. And uh, if bile is not flowing to help toxins move out of the body, the body will say, hey, I have another exit strategy for this, and it's the skin. Like the skin is one of our biggest detoxifying organs that we have and we basically sweat all the time but it, it's in small amounts so it just kind of evaporates and that sweat is helping pull junk out of the body and and remove it um, and it's just a tool that we have so if those fats aren't digested they're one of those problems that the body's going to try and push out through the skin but they're it's kind of a bigger molecule than fits out through the skin and it starts clogging things up and all those fats um, create the skin irritations with the pores and, and we get kind of rash issues like that. Um, uh, and even if bile is flowing, it's possible that if a person is losing a lot of weight, then the body is pulling all of these toxins that have been stored in fat cells for a, a really long time. And it's starting to say, oh, I can start to get rid of some of this. I can burn this fat for fuel. And as it does that, a lot more of those stored toxins will come out but then the body will be like, yeah, I can't get rid of all of this at once. And what do I do with all this junk now? And it'll push it out through the skin. So a person can even be processing fats okay and still have rash or skin irritation issues if they happen to be dumping a lot of toxins at once. So, you know, drinking more water could help that. 
uh, for some people, but you know, not everybody wants to drink a whole lot more water if, if they don't have a lot of minerals in the system. I don't know that we'll get into that a lot in this episode or not, but I know we will in one, but people on keto a lot of times will say, drink all the water. But <laughs> That's on every diet. <laughs> right. Yeah. But you, you don't always want to do that, right? Correct. Um, well, speaking of what other people are telling us to do, a lot of times when people, I've seen like people post in groups that they're having issues with keto rash and some of the bigger pros just say that you need to not keto so hard. So basically they're telling you that maybe you need to add more carbs back into your plan and just eat less fats in order to get through the stage of keto rash. Um, is that because these people likely aren't processing fat well, or is there another reason? No, it, it really is uh, that or that um, they're moving out too many toxins. And, you know, it, it's saying that to not keto so hard, it, it really isn't the worst advice if that's the only piece of advice that they have because, you know, slowing the process down might help that bile start to flow a little bit better as they're increasing their fat intake because it's a lot of people eat low fat and this, the body never calls on the bile. It never says, hey, bring the bile down here to process this fat so it starts to get thick and sticky and it doesn't flow and then it can't move. So then when you eat fat, then the body's like, all right, let's get this bile flowing, but now it won't move and the whole the system is a little bit broken. It's not that the body isn't trying to do it, it's just that it, it, it needs help to function. So after time, if the person can deal with this rash or nausea and all these other issues that they're dealing with um, and kind of push through that and just be miserable, then <laughs> eventually the body may uh, be able to start squirting some bile through there and, and get it moving as it's called upon more often. But people that have had this issue for decades are usually not going to be able to fix it with just that. We like to see them do things like we use this beet greens supplement called beet flow from empirical labs. And that helps to thin the bile out so it can move better. And we use these Xenoplex coffee suppositories or somebody could do a coffee enema and, uh, and that can help get the bile moving a little bit better. So we like to see people cheat and make things easier. They don't, you, you don't have to be miserable and suffer in order to lose weight. You're allowed to work with your body and, and just get things going in the right way. Can you explain exactly what a coffee enema is? Because it sounds a little scary. It's, it is a little bit scary <laughs> because most people are not thing, you know, used to go and have things go in the back door. The back door <laughs> is usually an exit only area. Um, so Basically, you just brew up a, a pot of coffee, and then while it's really hot, you <laughs> dump it down your pants. Um, we have a video on that. We'll share it with you. No, but hopefully it, animated. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you go to YouTube and just Google, I mean, your YouTube, you search for uh, you know coffee enemas. There's a lot of people just kind of teaching you how to do it, and you basically you buy coffee that's specific for this uh, purpose. Uh, is a good way to do that or you're not really brewing coffee to do it in other words um, and then you have this bag that you fill with water and you get you there's a tube that you get and a little plug that you use as a plug and then you hang the bag and the water just kind of goes in there and you just kind of sit there for as long as you can handle it and so it's then, just yeah. like it sounds <laughs> yeah and then okay. you get on the toilet and it's like you're going to the bathroom but it <laughs> it's like sprays out and it's all yeah, it, it, we like the suppositories better. We have these coffee yeah. suppositories that we use and it's just, it's less intimidating. But if somebody knows how to do an enema and they want to do that, just know that it works pretty well. But it, it's not, like drinking coffee is not going to do the same thing. It, it basically, the coffee going in the back door like that dilates that biliary pathway so it opens up a little bit. So this method, you're not really thinning the bile so much as more as, opening the pathway up so it can flow a little bit better. And then we like to use the beet flow to uh, thin the bile so that it can move correctly. I've totally forgotten what the question is. <laughs> well, I have another question. So if people, okay. I think this is interesting. If people actually choose that route, which I'm not sure why they would when they could just do the Xenoplex, um, how often should they be doing those? Well, um, I like to see somebody, if they're doing the coffee suppository or either really, like the most effective thing that we've seen 
is when people do what we call a beat flow flush, where it's just like this one thing where you take a whole bunch of, of beat flow in, in a two hour period. Um, and then the day after that, they do a coffee suppository. And that combo seems to be the most effective combo. And if, if they're really having a lot of trouble with this, they could do that like once a week for three or four weeks. And maybe they're still taking the beat flow with meals as a, you know, to kind of keep it going. Um, but you don't need to do a coffee enema every day like a lot of people suggest. Uh, and I don't even recommend that, especially if your blood pressure is low because it can kind of wash out, uh, uh, you know, nutrients as well. Um, and so we don't want you doing that if you already don't have a lot of nutrients. Okay. And um, another thing that can happen when you're not digesting fat well is acne, which um, I know I've, I had acne as a child all the way up through my mid thirties. And so many books you read, so many doctors you go to, they just want to blame it all on hormones, especially in the cases of teenagers and women. So is that really ever the case where it's just a hormonal issue? Well, it, it, the reason they say that is because they, this person has this problem and then they run these tests and they say, oh, hormones are crazy. See, I told you it's a hormonal problem. But it's, it's kind of like uh, saying that, you know, every time there's a fire, there's all these guys in jackets and in this red truck and they're all running around. If we got rid of them, there wouldn't be any more fires. So it's not the firemen's fault that there's fires. They just happen to be there when there's a fire. And a lot of these problems that can lead to acne are uh, stress situations on the body. And so the body calls on these hormones and they jack up the hormone levels to kind of help things function because there aren't enough resources there to do so. So uh, a really big problem with that is, uh, is estrogen. Um, estrogen is a stress hormone. It's not just a female hormone. So if a female is, is very stressed or she has very low resources, maybe her blood pressure is really low, she can kind of look at her blood pressure and if it's real low, then that's a signal that there's not a lot of resources there and minerals for the body to use. And when those aren't there, the body will call on these stress hormones to kind of help things out. And Estrogen is one of the things that when it's really high, it can thicken the bile a lot and keep it from flowing correctly. So now there's no bile flow. You can't process fats. You can't remove toxins. Everything's getting pushed out through the skin. But you can see that when they look at that, oh, there's high hormones. So we need to give you hormone therapy to straighten that out. But you're really kind of just, you know, telling Mother Nature to piss off and you don't know, don't do it. Don't do what you're trying to do. We're going to do what we want to do and force the matter. So, um, there usually are other issues. It's not just the hormones going high that are causing the acne. So when you're deciding on whether or not a keto diet is right for you, is there any way to know if you already have acne, um, if it's caused by not digesting fat well, or if it's more of a hormonal imbalance? Well, look at, like, are you the, like, we talked about some symptoms at the beginning of the show and like, were you sitting there listening? Like, are they looking at me right now? Are they, <laughs> are they spying on me? Like, if that's you, that's a lot of signs telling you that your bile is probably not flowing correctly. Um, so if you can start to take some steps to improve that and let's say that, you know, one or two of those other th symptoms or signs, you know, maybe your stool starts to get darker or maybe you saw that Billy Rubin on the dipstick and that starts to go away, but you still have acne, um, then you can say, okay, maybe this is going in the right direction. I'm going to keep working on this and see if these other symptoms improve and then see if the acne improves. Because it's not like you just start doing this on Tuesday and then by Friday, everything's fixed. You know, no. It depends on how severe the, the issue is with you. It depends on other things going on with your life and your body that may be pushing you the wrong direction. You know, if somebody's on birth control medications, uh, that's a powerful pharmaceutical drug that is raising estrogen and doing natural things to correct that may not be strong enough. So it depends on things you may be doing to work against yourself. So there's a lot of factors here, but when you start seeing some signs improve, then you know, hey, maybe some others are going to improve too. But you're also not telling people to go off their birth control because there's a lot of keto babies in the world. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm definitely not telling people to <laughs> stop taking any medication that you're taking whatsoever. I, I never do that. But it is good to understand um, 
when a medication is causing a problem because most people don't know that. Your doctor doesn't tell you, Here, here's your birth control and by the way, it's going to cause this and then you're going to have this and then this is going to happen. Um, instead, now you know what you're doing that's causing a problem so you can start investigating other solutions if you want to do that. But you want to implement other solutions before you stop whatever it is that you're using and you have to do that with your doctor. It's interesting because when I was younger, um, a lot of girls that I knew went on birth control to help improve their acne. Right. There were some birth controls that had the ability, they may even, because there was birth controls that were causing a lot of acne. So then like, oh, let's put this thing in there that can help acne. And now we'll just put you on birth control to help your acne. And there's other issues um, that it could do that was kind of regulating some things that, that seemed to help. But those are usually different issues um, that are causing the acne and, and, and that's why you kind of see it forcing that symptom to correct itself without correcting the actual underlying problem. So when we do things that way, other problems usually go up because, you know, like we talked about, acne is not the only issue that a lack of bile flow is going to cause. You're, the other thing that happens with a lot of these birth controls is that women gain weight and that's because you're, you're kind of shutting down that tool the body used to remove toxins. And now guess what? Those toxins are just going to get shoved in fat cells so they don't cause a lot of trouble. And now, um, so when I first heard of acne when I was a teenager, um, everyone said, oh, it's if you eat too much chocolate or you eat too much greasy food, you're going to get acne. And then as I got older and I had issues with it, other people said, well, what you eat isn't a problem. You just get this cream and put it on it and you're good. Yeah, you have um, a cream deficiency. <laughs> yeah. So obviously I've since learned the truth, but um, how does what you eat actually play a role? Well, again, if, if, if anything that you eat is viewed upon as a toxin to your body, um, <clears throat> especially like, you know, they talk about fried foods and the oils that they fry those foods in are, are toxic to us. Those are real problematic. Um, but then they look at, well, that can't be it because Susie eats fried cheese and Tommy eats fried cheese and only Tommy has acne. So it, it's not the fried cheese. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about fried cheese so much. <laughs> it's been a really long time since I had fried cheese. Yeah. Uh, but the, the problem is Susie is having the ability to uh, process those fats better and remove them where maybe Tommy isn't. So um, you, again, we got to look at the person. We got to look at the person and what's going on with them instead of what's the right food for acne. It can't be a right food for acne. It has to be fixing whatever the problem is for that person that's causing the acne. We okay. should do a course on acne. We should. There's a lot of people that have been stared in the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, so what about, let's talk about fat digestion when it comes to some of the topics that my kids might be interested in. Let's talk and, about gas and okay. poop. Before that, before we get to gas and poop, I was just thinking, you know, because sometimes like I'm at a grocery store and I'll see some kid and he's just like, it's just, it's pain. Like you can see that it's painful. And I always want to be like, can I, can I just send you a podcast episode or something like that? But I don't want to like, oh, I don't want to scar him more. I don't want to, he's like, you're just talking to me because I have my acne. And so I just, I don't know. So if you're a person listening with horrible acne, would you want me to come up with a store? And if I had a solution, do you want to know about it? Or do I, should I just continue to shut up? You email me and let me know. Okay, back to what we're talking. Let's get to the poop. When right. have I ever not wanted to talk about poop? Gas and poop tied together. I mean, so everyone thinks that gas is just a normal part of life that everyone has. Mm -hmm. um, some people think it comes from eating beans. There's a little rhyme that goes along with that. But why isn't that true? And how does gas signal digestion needs improvement? And well, also, how can it stall your weight loss? Well, the, uh, the gas with the beans things can be true. That's why they got that cool <laughs> song, because beans kind of break down further down the intestinal tract. Um, and if it's not happening well, then they kind of ferment, and that's where you get that gas. Um, but we're not going to go into the song today. Uh, <laughs> but again, this is a, it's a big deal with processing fats, because often... Um, gas is an issue of, of bile not flowing correctly so that the, the food isn't really breaking apart because digestion happens because of this acid that's leaving the stomach, meeting this bile that's very alkaline. So it's like the opposite. 
And when they hit, it creates like this sizzle, like you would see when you mix, you know, baking soda with vinegar. And it's that sizzle that helps us break everything apart. So the things that don't get broken apart and digested are now going to kind of rot and ferment and that process creates gases. And if it's happening further down the line, the gases come out the back door. And if it's happening more in the stomach, then we may burp up more of those gases. But either way, the gases are escaping or we just explode. So that's always a sign of you need to work on uh, digestion, either bile or acid production or, or both. And so if you're getting these gases and you just keep adding more fat in because that's what everyone's saying is to eat more fat. Is that likely going to stall your weight loss? Attempts? Yeah. Yeah, it could because now you're adding in more foods that your body can process. Mm -hmm. So especially initially, you're probably going to gain weight. And we see that a lot with people when they first go on keto, you know, cause they're still transitioning. Maybe they're still eating too many carbs and now they're increasing fat. So they gain weight or maybe they're adding fats that they can't process. So they gain weight. So, you know, again, that at just keep eating more fat that has worked for a guy before and the reason it worked is because maybe his bile just needed a little bit of help it just needed to be called into action you know for four or five days until it was like finally flowing correctly because that guy just needed a little boost but for the people who need more than just a little boost continue to increase your fat is just going to make you hate the keto keto guru more every day and until you have a poster on your wall and you're throwing darts at his face. So yes. um, we like to see people help their body fix the problem so they don't have to go through the suffer period. Okay. And what about, so we covered gas. What about poop? Um, how can you tell by looking in the toilet if you are digesting fat well or not? Well, if you're seeing a lot of like food in your stool, you know you're not digesting correctly because the food is not supposed to come out the other end. It's supposed to yeah. break down. Um, and then if the, if the stool is too loose and it's, you're having screaming diarrhea all day, then that's uh, very often an issue of a lack of bile flow because there's nothing there to neutralize the acids. So they just kind of start going through the intestinal tract and burning your intestinal tract. So the body's like, let's get this out of here. <laughs> um, but the, really the color of the stool is the big thing. You want to see it darker than the color of like, you know, a cardboard box. Okay. And um, what about the other side of the issue? I know a lot of people who start keto, um, right away they start struggling with constipation. So can not pooping regularly actually signal a sign of not digesting fat well? Kind of. And when, it, when I look at <clears throat> constipation, it's usually an issue of not enough stomach acid because the stool kind of moves uh, according, at a pace according to its acidity level. So if it's too alkaline, uh, maybe bile is flowing okay, but there's no stomach acid, then it will move really slow. Uh, and if it's too acidic, because there's no bile flow, it'll move really fast. But what we see is we talked earlier about how your body needs minerals to make HCL. So when insulin starts to come down, as you're eating less and less carbs, insulin can really come down. And when that's the case, it can cause the body to pee out more minerals. So if a, a person already had like really low blood pressure or they had really low mineral content, um, now it's getting even worse because they're doing keto. So now the body doesn't have the minerals to make as much stomach acid as it was. And maybe it wasn't even making enough, but now it's making even less and now the stool is going to slow down and they're going to get constipated. So if bile isn't flowing correctly, they're still not able to pull enough minerals out and now the minerals can go lower and then they can get constipated that way too. So it's, those problems seem to be the most common with the people who are kind of on the fence where maybe they have a slight issue there, but it's not such an issue that they're seeing a lot of symptoms from it. And then with this one little adjustment, it's enough to make it where like, oh wow, I haven't pooped in a week and now I hate everybody. Look at all those people pooping. I just want to be a pooper. Uh, and so it seems like, oh, keto makes you not poop. But when you understand what's causing it, it, it's really that you had an issue that it just magnified a little bit and you can fix that issue. I think that's good for people to hear because um, there's a lot of advice on the message boards. Like if someone complains they're constipated, um, pretty often I see like 
take more magnesium, take all the magnesium, take more MCT oil. And that's really all other people have to offer. Right. And the reason those things work, uh, you know, magnesium is very pro-catabolic. So it helps the body send more water to the bowels. So when major constipation, if this is a problem for you, my book, Constipation Kick It Naturally, really walks through all the possibilities. We won't do all that here, but it's either where the stool is too, al uh, too alkaline or not enough water is going to the bowels and the skull going to the kidneys. So uh, when a person starts to keto, if they're having this issue, they could force diarrhea by taking a whole bunch of magnesium and sending all the water to the bowels. But if the problem is really a lack of stomach acid, you're not really fixing the problem. So again, you want to look at the person and, and see what's going on and which one of those things would help the most. All right. So for those people who get really excited by some of the results they see on, like they've seen other people have on keto and they're, they're excited to go into it and then <clears throat> they start keto and they realize that they're not digesting fat. Well, what are some of the things are some of the reasons that they may not be digesting fat? Well, well, we talked about high estrogen. That's a big one, but uh, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the foods that we eat now that are processed can also thicken up the bile. So it won't flow correctly. Uh, there's an imbalance that we talk about sometimes called a catabolic imbalance that um, can also cause the bile to become too thick and sticky. Uh, grains seem to be a big cause for bile getting too thick and sticky. And, you know, 95% of the population is thinking they're supposed to eat whole grains all day, every day to be healthy. Um, so most people are, are, are eating that way. Well, what about with um, keto? So people are removing the grains. Do they need more help a lot of times than just removing them? Right, because by then, a lot of times they're broken. And so like we talked about, if someone just needs a little bit of boost, sometimes moving to keto, which would call on that bile to be utilized more often, could eventually get that flowing over some time. But most people need help. Most people need to use some type of supplemental help like we've been talking about to get the, the bile flowing correctly because most of us that have this issue have been doing these things for if not years decades yeah i mean since since we were wearing parachute pants we've been running from fat in horror since the days of low fat diets which can also lead to poor digestion of fat right and i think the, I think breaking to electric boogaloo came out the day that they said that. If you really need to mark the time in your head. <laughs> I don't know that song. I'll, I'll take that no, as a good a, thing. It was a movie. It was a breakdancing oh, movie. movie. So you okay. know it was in the 80s. Yeah, I don't know that either. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this one might seem obvious to some people, but I know a lot of people are still confused about it. Why are people gaining weight on keto when they're not digesting fat well? Well, you're, you're, first of all, let's say you're not processing the fats and it becomes toxic, so your body stores that in fat cells. We talked about that a lot already. But even if you're um, processing fats okay, you can still gain weight with keto if you're still in a mode of your body is not using fat as your primary fuel source. Because if you're still in the transitioning from carbs or um, maybe you're not in a high enough state of ketosis yet, your body is saying, oh, I, I have this glucose, so I'm just going to use that. I'm really good at burning that for fuel, but look at this fat coming in. This is nice. I'm going to put this in the bank to save for later in case I need fuel later. This is going to be beautiful, and now my jeans don't button. So it's just your body's way of being smart, really, because it doesn't know that there's not going to be a, a famine next week. It doesn't know that there's not going to be any fuel. Uh, so it has this extra fuel coming in that's not its primary fuel source, so it just saves it for an emergency. So as you start to move more towards using fat as your primary fuel source and you can digest those fats so that they can actually be utilized and they're not becoming a problem, that's when the weight really starts to fall off. But it's those people who kind of stick in the middle and they do like, you know, I'm going to do keto on Thursdays. Thursdays yeah. are gonna, is going to be my keto day. Don't do that. Are those people that are following a low calorie keto kind of diet? Right. And what do you see as the biggest problems between the, the, the people, you know, partially doing keto or doing low calorie keto? That they stall. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Um, but there's a lot of people recommending it that they tell you you still need to count your calories and you need to keep them low while eating a high fat diet, which kind of doesn't really work well together. Well, just keep remember that there was this guy, Eddie, I think was his name and it worked for him. So now they say, oh, that worked for him. And, that, and so we're going to tell everybody. And if a person has a lot of weight to lose, the body knows it has this you know, reserve of fat for fuel. And when things get difficult, that body may be a little more willing to access that stored fat for fuel, where there's a lot of other circumstances where the body is just not going to be willing to do that um, until more things are working correctly. So obviously, it's pretty important to have the capability to properly break down fat if you're going to go on a diet that is, by definition, a high-fat diet. Um, it's really important. I'm glad people are here getting the inside scoop. But why do you think more keto experts don't talk about this? Because it's easy to do this. And I, I had done this in the past before I knew things, you know, when I was just working as a personal <clears throat> trainer. Um, you, you take these steps and it works for somebody. So it kind of drills into your brain. This is what works for people. So if it doesn't work for somebody else, um, that person is lying to me <laughs> or they're not trying hard enough. Or you had an hour yesterday where you weren't even on the treadmill. How could you go an hour without being on a treadmill? So um, it just creates this confusion when uh, there really are steps that can make it easier for a higher percentage of people. Because when the steps that they say to do, like eat more fat, you know, and those kind of things, when it works for, you know, some people, it's hard for them to accept the fact that that's not going to work for all people. And I think a lot of um, keto experts that are also doing keto themselves, they go into it because maybe they had health, pro health problems themselves and they fix themselves up. And then the route that they took is now the route that everyone should take, just like you're saying. And, you know, I've been there, I've had all the issues and I try to come to it with more of an open mind, like, yeah, this worked for me, but you're different. So it might not work for you. And I really try to help people get to the root of their problem to figure out what what will help them not what worked for me right and there are more and more people that are telling people you know what works for one person might not work for you but they're not always giving the person the tools that they need to investigate their own physiology to figure out what's more likely to work for them than someone else so you end up with this throwing darts at a dartboard hoping i hit the right spot kind of thing where you really want to um, get an idea of what's going on so that you can take steps that are more likely to improve your situation faster. And so now um, for all these hopeful ketoers that want to digest their fat better and they know that they need help, what can they do to help their bodies digest the fat that they're eating? Well, if you have one of those imbalances, like the catabolic imbalance, you could learn how to improve that. Um, <clears throat> that could be a really big uh, help to get bile flowing. If you, if you got excited when we were talking about, you know, putting water up the back door, you know, go at it, do it up real nice. That'll help. Nice sound effects. <laughs> yeah. the, the easiest step is using the beat flow. And that's why, that's what I do with all my clients. Cause I'm like, there are some other things you can do, but they work, you know, like 25% of the time. And a lot of them are, take a lot longer to do. So just do, do what's easy. Most people, they really want the results. They're willing to put in work. They're willing to invest in their health if it's going to work. So if you can give somebody things that are easy to do. Now, if a person's broke and can't afford to get beet flow, maybe they can't afford, you know, coffee suppositories. Um, there's sections in all of my books where I talk about here's some steps you can do if you can't afford supplements. But I mean, nine out of nine and a half people are going to say, give me the thing that's going to help me the fastest and, and be the easiest. So that's what we use the most. And what about um, people that are without a gallbladder? Do you think they absolutely always need ox bile or is there room for not using it with them? You know, there is room sometimes. And, you know, most really want to use ox bile because it's going to help the situation a lot. It's going to help them get more out of the fats that they're eating. Um, but if a person can't do that or maybe they're – constipated without a gallbladder, then taking ox bile is going to make that worse. There's other things that could help, like uh, vitamin B5 can help a little bit. 
Uh, an enzyme called lipase can sometimes help. Uh, those can be beneficial. But some people without a gallbladder still have bile moving through the system well enough that they can emulsify fats with that bile. It's just, it's not going to work as good as when they have their gallbladder and the bile is flowing correctly because it won't be enough bile sometimes. Maybe they won't be able to go as hard into eating as much fat as someone else might be able to do. But we still see people in our, in our keto decoded course support group without a, a gallbladder that are doing really well on keto. So we know that, that you can still thrive. Don't feel like you have to run from it, but you usually have to take steps because you don't want to use a diet that is focusing mostly on a food that you can't process. That's not, that's not going to benefit anybody. So you might need to do a little more work to, to make it happen. And would you say um, the best bet, like for people who are having these issues with digesting fat, should they just keep continuing to keto and add more fat until they just know how to digest it? Or should they go back to a low carb approach until they can improve their digestion? Yeah. You know, what's the, what's the issues that they're, you know, that you're dealing with, if that's the problem with you. And I, I like to usually <clears throat> see people uh, go back to a low carb approach for a little bit and maybe work on some of these things that we've talked about to see if they can improve the issue. Uh, they do have the option of, you know, remember those few people that they pushed through and slowly started increasing their fat and eventually got the bile moving and they, they did well, but it's a way to create misery in that process. So it depends on how much misery you like, you know, what, what's, what do you prefer? Do you prefer to spend money on some things that'll help you succeed? Or do you prefer to be a little bit miserable and just push through and save some money? You, you have some options and you can, uh, the first one works more often because most people quit before they get to the point where the body's going to do what they're trying to get it to do. Um, so how's your willpower and <laughs> how's your <laughs> threshold for misery? That's kind of what you got to look at. I was there in the misery. I, I, I probably felt the misery for like a week or two at a time before I gave up. <laughs> right. That's yeah. usually about what somebody's going to tolerate. Yep. The and they usually say, this guy is stupid. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that's all we really had. Did you have anything to add before I get to today's listener question? It seems like there was more things that I would want to subtract. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's, there's some <laughs> You can do that during that. editing. <laughs> all right, good. So yeah, nothing else to add though. Okay. Well then um, I have a question from Heather from Lansing, Illinois, which that's where I'm from, not Lansing, but Illinois. Um, what are your thoughts about fat bombs? Do you suggest eating them? And if so, how many can you eat per day? Why don't you talk about this a little bit? Because you're the fat bomb queen. I am. I get that question a lot, um, when, especially when I post a new fat bomb recipe. The first question is, how many of these can I eat in a day? Um, people get really excited. And I personally, not so much anymore, um, but for a long time, I ate a lot of fat bombs. But you know, I was trying to keep my fat high in order to lose weight. And that was just the food that I preferred. Um, but I don't suggest that people eat that many, not as many as I did. And there's really no number that I can give you because a lot of it is going to depend on, like we talked about, how well you're digesting fat. Um, if you're not digesting it well, you don't want to just throw a bunch of fat bombs down. Um, but also, um, depending on, because most of the fat bomb recipes that I make also have carbs and protein. So you definitely want to keep an eye on um, how many carbs you had that day and how many extra carbs your fat bombs are adding to your day. And for some really sensitive people, it can be true with protein. If you're using fat bombs that are higher in cream cheese or you know right. other things that have um, protein in it, like there's some fat bombs that have bacon, which is delicious, but it still has protein. So um, if you're getting too close to your protein macro for the day, then that's kind of what you need to look at with fat bombs. Right, exactly. And you know, like, uh, we kind of set up our, our, cause we have a low carb cooking course and a keto cooking course. And we kind of set up where people can get like a platinum membership so that if they start doing keto and they realize, Oh, I need to fix some things before I can really thrive on this. They can just go right over to the low carb course. And in that course, we talk about fat bombs still, even on a low carb course, but we, we talk about using smaller serving size fat bombs. And if you're going to eat a meal that's already high in fat, you probably don't need a fat bomb for that because you're not trying to eat a lot of fat like you would on a keto diet if you're still in, in a low carb mode. So you still want to 
give your body some fat so that it knows that it can let go of stored fat. You just don't want to give it so much while you're still allowing your body to burn glucose as a primary fuel source. Yeah. And also I think um, when you're on a keto diet, fat bombs actually can become important um, because a lot of people don't want to add that much butter to their meat and vegetables. Right. They don't want to scoop coconut oil out of the jar. And you really do need to keep your fat high, especially at the beginning. Um, maybe you can taper off as you're losing weight, but at the beginning, it needs to be a lot higher than most people are used to. And so eating fat bombs is a great way to raise your fat. It's a way to cheat and make it easier to do so. Because yes. you don't, you know, maybe you can't have a ribeye steak every meal and you don't want to eat the butter off the wrapper kind of thing. So this allows you to eat a meal that you might like the taste of and still get a lot of fat with the fat bomb. Right. Do it up, Heather. <laughs> um, so I think that's it. And then we also have a download today that actually is coming directly from our Keto Cooking Decoded course. So you get a little bit of a sneak peek into that course that we talked about. And it's actually a guide on how to make fat bombs because there's a lot of different fat bombs out there. They're sweet and savory. So we have a guide that can walk you step-by-step step on how to make these delicious treats if you are a first-time fat bomber. Right. So you can get that on the show notes page. Just go to chatthefat.com slash episode two. And then you're going to do a, a kind of a continuation of this episode. We're going to get a bonus this week. So there's going to be an extra episode that it'll be like a 2.5 that Miss is going to do. What are you going to talk about there? Um, so I had a long journey with digesting fat well. I was never really the um, person who was scared of fat because I realized at a young age that I just didn't feel good when I was keeping fat out of my diet, but I still, you know, spent a long time on medications that weren't great for me and eating all the wrong foods. Even the fat I ate was the wrong kind of fat. So I was not digesting fat well, and I was exhibiting many of the symptoms that we talked about today. So I was just going to go a little bit deeper into that and talk about my journey and all the steps that I had to take to fix it up. Okay. That's going to be awesome. So that should come out uh, later on this week. And then next week, you guys are in for a big treat because we're going to have our episode where we interview uh, Jimmy and Christine Moore. And, uh, you know, Jimmy is the, the captain of keto. He's been talking about this stuff uh, longer than most people. And uh, we had an amazing time. I'm really excited for you guys to hear that episode. So be sure to go to iTunes and uh, click the subscribe button so that you make sure you get that. All right. Okay, that's it, guys. We will see you next week. Bye. Whether you're brand new to keto or just looking to move past roadblocks, join us for our next Troubleshooting Keto Master Workshop. Go to chatthefat.com slash workshop to find upcoming dates and register for this totally free event. You just might find your missing piece of the puzzle. Until then, we'll see you next week on Chat the Fat. <laughs>